is this thing on? Seems like it. All right. Hello and welcome to an episode of Hedgehog Makes. My name is Austin, aka Zombie Hedgehog, and today we're just gonna be hanging out talking about 3D printing. Uh, this is the first of however many episodes of a How Do You 3D Print series. And this one I've titled From Beginning for From Beginner to Expert. So pretty much everything that I've learned with my experience 3D printing, I'll go over that. Um that might help beginners, that might actually help experts, or anyone in between. So if you 3D print, this is something that you'll want to attend, ask questions in, and have a great time. So this is episode one. Why don't we begin? So as a little bit of a background, I've been 3D printing for almost a year. I have numerous printers, I've built printers, I have service printers, etc. And I help run a channel on Twitch called Maker Deck, which is a 24-7 live stream that does a lot of 3D printing content. I'll have the link down in the description for that. But I get to see so many 3D printers and it's awesome. And I get to talk to a ton of people who 3D print. So that being said, I have just accumulated a bunch of tips and tricks Nothing extremely formal, just you ask a question and I will try to answer it. If there are no questions, then I have <laughs> many things I can talk about. And a couple of them are stuff such as getting started. So, where do I begin? Wow, where do you begin with 3D printing? That's a good question. Where do you begin? Ah, well, you need a 3D printer, right? And there are plenty of videos on selecting a 3D printer. There's a ton of 3D printer reviews and everyone's going to have a very different situation. So when selecting a 3D printer, I like to recommend going to the community, asking, saying, hey, at this specific moment in time, what's the best 3D printer that suits my requirements? Now, don't go over the requirements. That's a good one. What are the things you should look for in a 3D printer? You know, my question of the day. Um, what is your question of the day? You have a lot of questions, don't you? But yeah, what do you look for in a 3D printer? Ooh. Well, what are you printing? So for example, down below me, I am printing off a section of an IKEA lac table that you can print. This is available on printables. It's a fully 3D printed, 3D printer, or 3D printed. We have those two. This is a fully 3D printed lac table. This is one of nine pieces. I just started printing this. I saw some printables. I'm like, you know what? This is a great use of excess filament. So we could talk a bit more about this in the future, but um, that is something that you might want to print. So the first thing you have to look at is size. That's the biggest differentiation between all of these printers is size. There's different classes of printers. You have the micro size printer, such as the Voron Zero. Um, I think the Ender 2 is 160. So this stuff less then 180 millimeters, which is the build size. Uh, for example, let me just grab a couple of flex plates. So this king right here is 180. So this sheet represents a little bit more than the build area you can print on. And by build area, I mean how big in the X and Y axis can you print? So as you can clearly see, 
this print it would be too large for this printer because you know it wouldn't fit so you have to look and say okay if i want to print stuff like this i need to get a printer that is bigger than this so my recommendation is to go and look around look on places like printables on twitter on youtube see what people are printing and see what you might want to print and then find out the size of whatever the model is for example 200 millimeters on its largest dimension 300 millimeters uh, 250 etc find how large of an object that you're trying to print or that you might want to print and then that's a good starting point of where to look for in a printer you might want to do just small things like these little flexies this is just a flexible shark available on printables most of this stuff is available on printables but this right here and this is specifically printed in Polymaker's, uh, one of their dual color filaments. This can be printed on just about any printer. It's small, and it just uses a regular silk. So you can print this fairly easily. So if you want to do small stuff like this, which is still very fun and still very practical. Well, this is more of a toy, but you can do small stuff that's like this on almost any printer. Um, you can print just in general small things. You can do small and tall things like this Pikachu. Right, this is kind of, it doesn't take up a lot of footprint. So you can print it on just about any printer. But, you know, like I was showing, you might want to print off larger stuff like that table, which is kind of a, I wouldn't buy a 3D printer to 3D print like an Ikea LAC table. You just go buy one. But as like a fun thing to do, give excess filament. It's pretty cool. I actually specifically designed this. This is a part sorting tray available on my printables. This, this is my design. Um, I designed this to fit nicely on a 180 millimeter printer. So some people, a lot of people actually design for the most popular printers or at least the most popular sizes. I would say 180 by 180, aka a Prusa Mini, is going to be one of the more popular sizes and models will be scaled to fit on that. And then you have the Prusa i3, currently on the MK3S, which is a, I believe a 210 by 250 printer. And those sizes are millimeters, how long on the x-axis and how long on the y-axis you can print. So this model is specifically designed for that. In fact, I have one right over here. Yeah, right here. This demonstrates essentially the largest item you can print on a Prusa i3. So this is a storage box, the S box, full size, available over in printables. So this, you see the dimensions that's scaled to perfectly fit this prints and pieces, but the largest pieces scale to fit on a Prusa. Uh, so that's a, that's kind of a, a general theme is that designers will take a model and if there's no specific size requirements, like this is just a custom container system, it doesn't have to be a certain size. You're not making it um, fit with any other parts. So, you can make it whatever size you want. Uh, so, for the size of 3D printer, I narrow it down to really two sizes. There's the 180 size, so around 180 or slightly bigger, or the 220 and higher bracket. So 220 or 210, aka an Ender 3 or Prusa i3. So those two different sizes are what's probably the most common and then slight deviation of those dimensions. But the more important thing is you're going for a kind of a small printer or a larger printer. My recommendation when you're starting, if I don't know anything about 
what you're trying to do with 3D printing, I'm going to recommend the larger printer. So Ender 3 Prusa i3 size, because you can print the larger things like this or this or anything else. But if you want to, you can also print the smaller things. That's fine. You can print tiny, tiny things on any printer. This is a little hedgehog that I've been saving. This was printed on the 0.2 nozzle, so a really fine nozzle. And this was done on an Ender 3. Just with a really small nozzle and going slow. So you can print tiny things on any size printer. It just makes you know more sense to print something like this on a small printer. So I'm not going to give any specific recommendations for printers. I recommend searching what's the best as of now. Again, ask the community. I do have a Patreon link down below if you want to ask me personally, uh, you know, privately what I recommend and I can look and see what's on the market, look and see what other people are having a good time with and recommend that. So that's the size of printer. And that's the first thing I like to start with, with the size. Figure out what you're going to print. Um, what else do you do from there? So now that you know the rough size, you don't really need much more. Honestly, you're again going to search into the community. If you have a large printer, my general recommendation is having a bed probe, so something that can create a bed mesh. It's called automatic bed leveling, at least that's what it's commonly referred to as. ABL, automatic bed leveling, commonly in the form of a BL touch or an inductive probe. That will create a bed mesh, aka it'll compensate for any type of tilt in your or warping on your build plate. And for beginners, Having a good first layer is the most important thing in a 3D printer. Everyone's going to struggle with getting good first layers. And that's something we could talk about how to improve your first layer experience. But a lot of it is having a probe, some way of actually sensing where the bed is in relationship to the nozzle. Once you have that, it's not too hard to compensate for. Uh, also, um, I like flex plates. That's another thing I recommend for beginners. Glass beds are okay. They work, but removing parts on glass can be very challenging sometimes, depending on uh, what you're printing and how you print it and what type of bed it is. But glass sticks so, so well. It's extremely difficult to remove prints off of. At least that's my experience of it. So I would recommend a flex plate Something like I just showed off. Um, let's, uh, let's grab this one right here. So a flex plate is just a, this is a spring steel shape. So it looks like this. It's a sheet of thin spring steel. That's, I guess that's what it's referred to. And it's pretty stiff, but you can flex it. So it stays nice and flat. It attaches to your bed via magnet, but you're able to kind of just pop a part off and it makes part removal easy. The downside is if you have a very big bed, well, the, they can warp and I generally recommend pairing them with an ABL. So again, summarize what are you looking for for a printer, find what size you want. And then I recommend if you have a larger printer uh, to get a probe, if possible, it'll make your life easier. And then I do recommend a flex plate, specifically a PEI sheet. So that's where you start. Then what? What do you do? You have a 3D printer. What's next? You print stuff. You print stuff. So this is where I'm going to start answering some questions in chat. But what do you do when you start? Should you go and ask questions to the community? Should you experiment? Should you watch videos? What do you do? Well, I like to suggest talking to the community, talking to other people who 3D print. 
they're going to have a lot more knowledge about 3D printing and um, they can steer you in a direction, whether it's the correct direction that you need to go in or if it's a direction that works best for you, that might vary. So take all public information with a grain of salt. Even what I say, your experiences might not align up with mine and that's okay. What's important is understanding why you might want to do something. So you might want to buy a PEI sheet for your printer for better part removal. But maybe what works best for you is glass. So weigh the options for everything and ask plenty of questions. There is no limitation to questions. Another helpful resource is the Polymaker Discord. So I currently help run that. If you want to join, there should be a link in the video description. If not, I will make sure there is one. But it's a great resource to not only ask questions about Polymaker Filament, uh, which I, I have a few spools of, and for me, it's been printing great. In fact, like all of this is Polymaker. Uh, a lot of the stuff I print is Polymaker. They do send over filament, and I greatly appreciate it. But it allows me to print stuff and try stuff. I also have other brands such as you know, Appreciament, Print Bed, Printed Solid, like it's important to try many different brands and see what works best for you. But the Polymaker Discord isn't just about filament. It's about helping you become a better 3D printer by providing print science, um, being able to talk to people with experiences, like I was saying, ask questions. There's custom printer uh, enthusiasts on there. So if you want to build your own printer, plenty of info. So I strongly recommend checking that out. And let me get into some of the comments. So welcome in, Golden Jaguar. How's it going? Um, wow, I don't like YouTube chat. <laughs> I'm used to Twitch chat. Okay, let's start at the beginning. All right. So the first question is from Griffin's Closet Print Farm. Rails, how to align them. How do you align linear rails? Actually, I have a part for that. So linear rails. I can show you one. And I did rearrange the studio. If you've watched the previous stream, I'm starting to do my overhaul of the studio. So let me know if you like it. Let me know why my drawers won't shut. <laughs> uh, oh, I guess that's staying as is. That'll just bug someone. But this is an example of a linear rail. This is one form of motion system for your 3D printer. Um, I can get into those little deeper. Okay. In general, for this stream, I'm going to try to keep it as high level as possible. So make sure to ask specific questions in chat and I will give you as like a genie, right? You have to ask very specific questions to get a specific answer. But for a linear rail, the best way to align them is to print a guide. This is an example of a alignment tool for a 2020 extrusion. So this is common on a 3D printer like an Ender 3. A lot of designs are tailored for 12 millimeter rails. And this will slot into a um, 2020 extrusion. And you want to make sure that there's, you know, no real slack. Like I can move this around a little bit, but it's pretty firm. So get this so it fits very snugly on your rail and also fits very snug on your extrusion. So you'd hypothetically print two of these off, put one on each side, put it on your extrusion. And then when you're tightening linear rails, one thing I've learned is you want to start from the middle and work your way out. Um, I would kind of snugly tighten all the screws and then go back after and fully tighten them. There's a very specific process of installing a linear rail. That's, you know, use your alignment tool to the best of your ability to get it straightened onto the rail. This also assumes that all of your rails in your printer are square. But you put on that and then you start from the middle, put in your screws and then uh, tighten them down. And when you're tightening them, you want to continuously move your carriage. You always want this to move smoothly. If there's 
any resistance at all, let's say that um, you're trying to screw it in and something isn't aligned right, and you feel it like, oh, it's kind of crunchy right here, or it doesn't roll smooth, then either you have a bad rail, which you should be using a high quality rail like these uh, uh, West 3D rails, or make sure that your screws are in adequately. You can over tighten them, you can under tighten them. So do one screw at a time, tighten it, move this back and forth, make sure it's still smooth, and then go back and forth until every single screw is tightened. When you're doing a linear rail, you actually want to do every other. I don't know if that's a requirement, but since you're actually referencing the rail as your plane of motion, you don't want this to be tight against your extrusion because the extrusion is not going to be square or flat ever. It's going to be close, but it's not going to be perfect. So you kind of want to lightly attach this, but as snug as possible, if that makes sense. So you're not trying to torque this down onto an extrusion. The extrusion is there to just support it. So that is how you align a linear rail. Of course, before you put on your rail, make sure to lubricate it. It's a lot easier to do before or after. So going down this list, what type of 3D printer should a beginner get? Um, if I'm going to answer that specific question, I would say it's best to get a small printer like the uh, Prusa Mini, that size printer, a KP3S sized, Something that is small, it's easier to level the bed, so you'll get better first layers. Now, if you want a larger printer that has an automatic bed leveling system, that might also be better. So something with good bed options, something that you can easily adjust your bed. Uh, and also something we'll get into in a later date, but firmware. Oh boy, there are some printers that come with firmware that is very difficult to work with from experience. So make sure that you actually look up this printer and figure out how to use the stock firmware and if there's a possibility to upgrade the firmware to something different. Uh, all right, good questions. Um, right here we have And how's the music, by the way? Is that a good volume? Higher, lower? I think it's about what I typically have. I'm using uh, a different software than I usually stream on Twitch. And by the way, I do stream on Twitch more regularly than YouTube. So if you like this content, Twitch is a fun place to hang out and ask these same questions. That's fine. But also, I typically do projects on there, just random stuff. On YouTube, I try to do more streamlined projects like... Oh, I don't know. Um, future fully printed 3D printers might be content on this stream. I will finish the Rook. Uh, this one right here. This is the Rook MK1. I'm going to continue to tune up and get used to it. And then once that's finished, that's when part two is coming. So thank you everyone for asking. But once that printer is done. <sighs> if money wasn't an issue, but simplicity is the focus, what would you recommend? If money is an issue, but simplicity is a focus. There's only one printer that I would really recommend if you want simplicity. And that's not the simplicity mod for a Rook available over on the, the Rolohan Discord. But that would be probably the Prusa MK3 because it's a simple machine, it's just a basic bed slinger that's using high quality components but also has a full calibration process, and that's what's important. It'll walk you through calibrating your printer instead of giving you a vague manual, not even telling you to adjust your B-wheels. So the whole Prusa ecosystem is kind of easy. It's probably the easiest way to get into 3D printing, which is why I recommend stuff like a Prusa Mark III or even a Mini if you want to just get the easiest possible introduction. And as of now, there is really isn't, at least from my experience, which isn't a ton on new printers, but 
I haven't found a lot of printers that walk you through, hold your hand as well as Prusa does. So definitely look into that. Uh, printer for a novice, if they can afford it, or an SVO6. I have not tried the SVO6 uh, by Sovol, but it seems like a pretty competent printer, and a lot of people are having fun with it. I'd love to try it one day. Does Marlin actually mesh or just a skewed plane? Um, I believe, I, I don't have a lot of experience with this, but I believe Marlin does do a bed mesh, meaning it'll form a 3D, three-dimensional mesh that gets compensated as you print. And otherwise, why would you probe a ton of points? You just probe four points and then make a plane. Catching up here. Sorry. Let's see anyone new popping in. Great, great. Listen, new people. If you, I've never met you, make sure to introduce yourself. And if you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. I'll be focusing more on this in the future. Let's see. Oh, geez. Uh, yeah, reading the, the comp, <laughs> scrolling through the chat is, I think maybe the text too small. I can't read it, but it's just a bit different than I'm used to. Okay. If I miss something, it's re-question, ask your question again. And if you need something, just tag me. Do at hedgehog makes, it should autofill, and then it will highlight um, orange for me, and I can actually see your message. So question from Coffee Tech 101. Is it difficult to set up Clipper on an older bed slinger? And is there any advantage of doing that versus buying a new 3D printer? So Clipper, for reference, is a combination of a firmware, aka the thing that goes on your printer to make it run, and what I like to consider uh, like a server. So an external computer that sends all the commands to your printer. The benefit of that is that all of the difficult processing is done on a computer like a Raspberry Pi or a laptop or even a desktop, but more commonly Raspberry Pi. All of the computation, or at least the majority of it, is done on that so you can send it more G-code. And more G-code, more commands, means hypothetically more faster printing. Uh, and there's a lot of other advantages to Clipper, such as um, real-time updating of different functions. Can I share this? Apparently, I finally updated Chrome, and it's happy. Like, thanks for updating me. Let's see. Does that work? Yeah, so this is an example of my Clipper interface. One of them. This is for my simple core printer which is a custom Core XY printer that I built. So Clipper gives you the ability to change stuff like pressure advance on the fly. You can set your speed. You can somewhat adjust your fans. You can see all the information that you need, what temperature your printer is running at. You can adjust your temperature right through here. Uh, you can pause, stop, and there's other things you can do as macros. There's so many things you can do with Clipper. And I love Clipper because it gives you flexibility. Plus, having all of your control, all of your files just in these nice, neat, laid out sections. This looks intimidating, but it's really not. It's very simple. Once you kind of understand what everything does, if you follow a guide, uh, let me know in the comments if you want to see a guide on how I use Clipper and how I set up Clipper. Let me know. But it's pretty cool. You can see your height map. So this is the bed mesh that we were talking about earlier. It's a mesh of your bed. So if there is an issue, like, you know, one corner is sunk down quite a bit, well, then maybe you want to look into re-leveling your bed or fixing any issues that there might be. In my case, uh, well, this bed's a little bit interestingly mounted. So <laughs> uh, this is more than fine. As long as you get a good first layer, doesn't matter. 
But yeah, that's this. And having macros to do the things like, you know, when the printer's off, you can send it to different locations. You can test your speed. You can load filament. You can PID tune with just one click of the button. It makes it very simple to do over on Clipper. And is it easy to install? Well, it depends on if your printer is compatible. Most boards are, but some of them aren't. So look into your specific printer. What I like to recommend is just typing um, X printer clipper install. For example, Ender 3 V2 clipper install. And then find a guide, make sure it's for that specific printer, uh, and then follow it. It takes about uh, five minutes to get Clipper installed and then many weeks of tuning from my experience. But if you're using a stock config, just like using a stock profile in your slicer, it's not super difficult. Plus, you can always ask a community like, again, the Polymaker community, MakerDeck, um, any of the other countless Facebooks or Discords for specific questions. So hopefully that answered your question. Is there any advantage versus buying a new printer? Well, you're going to run into the same issues. Um, you can print fast on a different printer, and some of the new printers come with a nice big touch screen with all of the settings right there. But just having the ability to go into your web browser and do stuff, and then you can even get a screen. Does that have handy? I don't, but you can get a little touch screen. Uh, you can't reuse your touch screen a lot of times with Clipper. You have to buy an additional screen. But I don't use screens on any of my printers. Zero. All my management is done right in my browser. So yeah, that's kind of the advantage is the the interface. Plus, you can go with you can do crazy speeds. Uh, of course, you're limited by how fast your printer can actually move. It can't make a you know a underpowered printer print faster. It can help it. And I guess the overall best thing about Clipper is Input Shaper. The ability to remove ringing. If you have a print, oh, do I have a bad print? <laughs> Look, looks around. Hmm. Are there any bad prints? Well, I've had a couple. Oh, I had a really bad speed bench the other day. Anytime you have text and you see like ghosting or kind of uh, like like lines, like ripples. Think of a wave. You know, a, a, a wave on the beach. If you see stuff like that in your prints. Well, that's caused by vibrations and the fact that you have a moving mass that needs to stop. Well, Input Shaper uses a sensor. I recommend using a sensor and it actually measures how much vibration is in your printer from a high level. And then it's able to real time cancel that out as you print. So it can help you print with faster acceleration and can just overall increase your print quality on a printer that you might have just dismissed for being old and slow. And we have a ginger. Everyone say hello, ginger. <laughs> Bluffy kitty. <sighs> Maybe you'll actually go on, the, on here today. There we go. I got space today. Look, my table's clean. No projects. Okay. <laughs> she says, no, I want to be in your lap. <laughs> going on if you have additional follow-up questions feel free to ask those too clipper yep um oh i skipped a bunch this is uh fun okay all right we have just just jasty in chat. Good morning, afternoon, evening. No idea what time zone I'm in. Uh, I'm in Eastern time for reference. So it is currently uh, 1041 p.m. Any update on the Kingroon KP5L printer? Ah, <laughs> I was planning on getting the printer, but I went ahead and got the Cobra Go. Yeah, so I actually just did a live stream on that printer on Twitch, trying to add a BL Touch, and oh boy. Uh, King Root printers, they're a good value if you use them pretty much stock. And you can do upgrades to them. 
but there is on every single printer every king room that i've had there's been one type of like not flaw but kind of unfortunate thing that's happened to them as uh, some of them is you know me trying to upgrade but others come like that out of the box so an update for the kp5l i lost my pei sheet so i'm trying to find it i have no idea where i put it but i have a pei sheet to put on there it seems to be working okay i need to adjust the motor currents in reality i kind of need to install a new control board on there and ginger's shedding we need to we need to get scrubbed Ugh. Yeah, um, right now I'm still tentative on that printer, like I have been. If you're willing to troubleshoot and upgrade it, then it c it's a good base for a printer. And I love how it has linear a linear motion system instead of V-wheels. Well, those are kind of linear, but you know what I mean, like a constrained linear motion system that's smooth. That's what I really liked about it, and... Uh, again, at this point, I need to do more testing on it before I can do a full recommendation. And you got the Cobra Go. Well, the Go is a smaller printer. Much smaller. Which isn't a bad thing. Oh, am I out of filament? Did I print finish? Oh, cool. <laughs> uh, smaller printer isn't a bad thing, but those are just two different size printers. And if you caught the beginning of the stream, having a bigger printer is it, it just depends what you need to print if you only need to print on the size of a cobra go that's great but if you might need that once in a while thing that's a larger printer or that a larger printer can handle then that might be a better recommendation just getting a larger printer in the first place but the, the go will probably suit you well i've heard people have had good experience with that just give it a little tlc if you have any questions Polymaker Discord is a great reference, again, and I do have a Patreon, which is in the link down below. I'm willing to answer any questions you have. If you want to DM me with... Uh, <laughs> Ginger. If you want to DM me, go ahead. Jump. No. Happy cat. Moving on, let's see. Prusha has great support. Yeah, if you're looking for a Prusha printer, I've heard pretty good good feedback on their customer support. If they can't help you, then they'll look into it. And there's usually a situation that someone else has had before you. If you're the first person who's ever had an issue, a very specific issue, then yeah, you might, might take a little bit longer. But Prusha's been around for a long time now, and tech support generally knows the issues be fun to actually get a Prusha. I'd love to get one. I would absolutely love to get the XL, which is a up to five head tool changer. Oh boy, that would make... <laughs> I'd be able to do a lot with that. Maybe one day. And hopefully you like the format of the stream. Let me know if you have any suggestions or you can always message me after and let me know if uh, I should make any specific improvements. Uh, let's see, any more questions in chat? Dylan G is looking into getting into printing. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, this is a pretty good place to ask questions. Uh, just like random stuff. It's easier to talk about something than to type a message. And, you know, I can just kind of naturally talk about this stuff, how it comes to my brain, versus having to type something. So I like this format versus different forms or both i like both honestly like i like to start here and then if you have a very specific question or a more of a broad question that needs a lot of answers it's best to do over in one of the forums so dylan says uh the svo6 is what bob recommended yeah i would i would feel comfortable recommending that printer based off of other users experiences with it it's going to have any down, you know, the downside of any cheap printer where you might have stuff break. And I don't believe you're going to get the best tech support versus a company like Prusa. 
But, you know, I need to try one. I need to have one break and have tech support happen. But it should, it should be a good entry-level printer. What do you think of the SVO6? Uh, I just said that. It seems like a good system. The SVO6, the only reason why it's, it's, it's a good printer versus something like an under 3, one of the biggest reasons is it has linear guides. So, you know, something like a linear rail, which is this, or a rod with a bearing, those use ball bearings, and they're stiff. Like, this is stiff. This isn't going to twist. It isn't going to move. You don't have to tension it. It just exists. And with V-wheels, you actually have to very precisely tune the tension of each V-wheel. If you don't, if it's too loose, then your print head will be wobbly, your bed will be wobbly, and your prints will suffer. If it's too tight, then your motors have to work extra hard, and the V-wheels will wear down very fast, and you'll get poor prints. If you manage to get just right, they work fine. But then they also rely on having an aluminum extrusion. And aluminum extrusions are extrusions. They're not precisely milled. So they might not be flat. That being said, you can get very, very good prints on something like an Ender 3. Just like a bare bones, off the shelf Ender 3. If you get a good quality one with good parts, it's not always the case. Uh, Griffin says, uh, don't own one personally, SVO6, but uh, they own an SVO5. And I believe there are a ton of mods for that printer or similar printers that work. And uh, that's probably a good place to start, SVO6. I think we're actually getting caught up in chat. What about a used refurbished instead of a new one? Ah, great question. There are a ton. And that's a good idea. If you have a question, uh, tag me so I can easily see it. Used printers. That's how I got into 3D printing. Well, no, it's not. I got a Ender 3v2 that was on sale. And I started modding it based off of recommendations from people in the community. I thought it was a lot of fun. Not only was I able to print stuff on my printer, but I was able to mod it. And I'm an engineer. I like tinkering. I like modding. I like this type of thing. And knowing that I can um, uh, mod or tinker with the machine is just as fun as 3D printing, like actually printing in my experience. So I love to build custom printers like these, you know, Rook printers, Rolohan's fully 3D printed printers, or upgrading stuff like the King Runes, getting replacement tool heads on there, or many, many other things. There's even, uh, right there, we have the BQBX, which is a nice printer, but actually, that's a great example. This, ignore the pumping with the Rook parts in there. This was my first used printer. So it's an eBay special. It was, you know, it came with a list of the stuff that it didn't have. It didn't have the screen, it didn't have the tool head. But other than that, it was perfectly fine. So I was able to take it and I added my own mods to it right away. I went kind of crazy. I added linear rails from West 3D. That's what got me into West 3D. And. I had to make my own tool head. What did I put on there? I don't know what it was. I think it was just one of the generic like Ender tool heads. Uh, maybe it was a Hero Me. But I tricked it out. And I got it printing very well. Until um, I over tinkered with it. I added linear rails. And not linear rails. The, the things that forums have. Uh, drag chain. I had a drag chain, but I didn't adjust my tension properly, and I snapped a couple of cables. I let it sit. Just, it was, it needed work, so I let it sit. And then I finally attempted to get this Enraged Rabbit Carrot Feeder working, which is an MMU, 
it's able to take up to six different filament spools and then extrude and retract them to change colors. I was able to get that working on here and I got some prints actually that are up to four colors right now calibrated. But something like this Benchy, I was able to get a four color Benchy. It worked. I had to do a lot of manual intervention, so it needs a lot of tuning. But I have some parts in to fix it. I'll probably end up actually trying to do a couple things tonight. But this was an example of a printer that I bought on eBay for cheap. It needed work. And I had a little bit of experience modding my Ender in order to fix that. If you're a beginner, I do not recommend getting a... Uh, oh, hello there. <laughs> I don't recommend getting a, um, a used printer. Do I have... Do I have this camera working? I need a cat cam here. No, it's okay. Ugh. There, there's, a, there's the cat cam. It's big though. That's what you guys want, right? <laughs> I have a carpet in here now, and Ginger's like, oh boy, this is great. <laughs> this will get, you know, this will get, a, I'm gonna leave it like this. Yeah, this is good. <laughs> this will get a lot more views. <laughs> Uh, what was I even talking about? Yeah, so new printer. If you're new to printing, get a new printer. If you want to tinker, get a working printer and then get your second printer. But you always want to have one good working printer. Where did I leave off? Wow, uh, I gotta like highlight these so I, I leave... Uh... Know where I'm at. All right, we go over there. And if I missed your question, just repost it and uh, tag me if you have a question. It makes it easier to see. Hey, Ratsky. All right. Just Jassy says, thank you so much for the review. I really like the KP5L, but the problem is I'm not very uh, mechanically advanced. Right, so you don't really understand what's going on with 3D printing, not 3D printing, but with the, the hardware part of it. And that's something very important. With a lot of these printers, you have to have some ability to learn. Not all printers you will be able to unbox and use. You have to do some type of mechanical tuning, setup, etc. So keep that in mind that not all printers are perfect out of the box. Okay. Acido Craft Gaming says, what do you think of the Orbiter? And is it still a decent extruder for the afterburner? Ah, Orbiter, you say? Hi. It was cuter when you're on the floor rolling around. Can you do that again? I need, I need views. Oh, wow, you're covered in... Seriously, I just bought this carpet. I literally unrolled this. And it's already covered in filament scraps. Like, <laughs> already. Well, we can do a live unboxing of an Orbiter. You want to do that? This is kind of a interesting stream regardless, so let's do it. There we go. Yeah, it's a table. Um, maybe. Um, <laughs> is it upstairs? I'll be right back. Ginger, can you uh, yeah, hop up from the table? Ask more questions? Get them queued? and I'll be able to answer them in a moment. Okay, back with special delivery. Just came in today. Oh, that'd be good. Yeah, I could put a cat bed down there. I'll have the cat like down on the bottom shelf. Hi, right, make sure there's no addresses. That is an Orbiter V2. This is the, I guess, LDO edition. Um, 
And I've been using one of these on my Simple Core. So my very fast, very reliable Core XY printer. I printed off this whole container on there. I did a lot of stuff. And it's part of the equation that is called a tool head. <laughs> tool head is just a bunch of variables and you have to add them together. And if they don't add up to one, then, well, you have issues. So the Orbiter, in my experience, has been a very, very clean extruder. We could talk about that a little more in detail, but the way that the Orbiter is designed, it's, it's good. It's good. Just trust me. Trust me, bro. So it comes in the box with... Uh, this is the West 3D version. Oh, cool. So it comes in the box with the extruder as a pre-attached LGO Pancake NEMA 14, uh, 1.8 degree, and it comes with a stock, very colorful cable. Uh, that's okay though, it's easier to trace your wires. And then it comes with a, yeah, so an Allen, Allen key, I don't use those, I have my own. And then I just realized it came with this. This is like an adapter to go from a normal printer to an ender because some printers will twist some of the wires and not all um, not all motors are wired the same. So that's neat. And what I love about this, besides the size, like this is the whole extruder. This is everything that's pushing the filament. It's awesome because of not the fact that this comes off that's not awesome but these this is your what do you call that drive gear what, what, what gear is that called it's it's the gear that makes contact with filament and these are huge they're much larger than bmg gears i don't have one directly on hand for comparison i could probably dig one out but just take my word for it that these are kind of a larger gear. And people like Mirage C have tested that the extruder quality makes a very, very big difference in your overall performance. Drive gear is attached to the stepper. Okay. Idler? Well, like even the one that's in there, like what are these called? What kind of gears are these? Not not just not this one, but the both of these, the dual, dual dual gears. But yeah, I was very surprised. I never really heard a lot about it. It uses a planetary gear reduction system. Uh, I'm not gonna take it apart because I want this to be in good working condition. But it uses a planetary gear that theoretically is just very clean. It should be pretty clean at, at printing. And it is. I've, I've had a good experience. So this just attaches onto your tool head. Of course, you'll have to have a compatible tool head. This one has the orbiter mounting bracket. So it mounts kind of like this on your tool head. It's very similar to the the Bontech, uh, what is that called? Uh, LGX Lite, how oh, it mounts, except it mounts top down. And LGX Lite versus Orbiter, well, honestly, they're pretty similar. And after testing both, I would go for the Orbiter, based off of how clean it's been working for me. And just its general size. It's just, it's a nice little extruder. Plus, you can adjust the tension perfectly to whatever you need. And I'll be installing this one. Probably in a Rook printer. I'll try to use it with Bowden. Um, I know you need to get some type of special adapter or print something. But I'll make it print Bowden one way or another. I actually have no idea. Because it's a direct drive tool head or extruder for the most part. Oops, we're not ending. 
But yeah, that's the Orbiter 2 from LDO. I purchased this from West3D. If you want to purchase your own extruder, I have an affiliate link down below. West3D has been incredible for both having a good selection of various printer parts, everywhere from entry level all the way up to premium. And uh, their customer support is well beyond what I would ever expect of a small company like that. So check them out. Link in the video description. And if you have any questions, let me know. Um, wow, uh, the skipped. Okay. Where did I see that? Okay, so that was from there. Moving on. Uh, Just Jassy says, I was planning to get the KP5L due to its print size because you want to use it for cosplay. Fair enough. But you think you got the right choice to Cobra Go. It's a bit of a hassle in printing a large size, though. It can be. If you're printing something large and you want to combine two things together, I do recommend uh, Gloop. It's now called Gloop. This stuff is probably the best uh, chemical used to bond different components. So if you're doing cosplay, check that out. It'll make combining different pieces a lot easier. Just wear gloves and make sure you're in a ventilated environment. I don't know if I have a... I don't have a link for Gloop. That'd be a good idea to have some, some Gloop links down below. <laughs> no, this is... Um, this is not uh, Steve's cat. We have a question. What do you think of the Orbiter? Oh, yeah, uh, we were just warm with that one. Is it still a decent extruder for the afterburner? Oh, for the afterburner. So the only thing, okay, back to Orbiter. With afterburner or with a Voron tool head, if you're using a tool head PCB, for example, I'm using the two part Heart K PCB. If you have that, I don't think you can use at least the regular Orbiter setup. So just be careful with compatibility. But if you're not using a PCB at all, then yeah, I believe you can just slot it on and it's probably the best extruder you can use for a stealth burner instead of the, the one you print yourself. When you print your own extruder, the quality of the extrusion is going to be almost directly related or proportionate to how well you print and how well you assemble it. So if you don't think you can, if you are confident that you can actually print and properly assemble an extruder, I would just buy one. And I think the Orbiter is not 3D printed. I think it's actually injection molded or, I, is it injection molded? It might be. Because I have some that are carbon fiber nylon, or just nylon in general. But this does not look printed. Yeah, this is definitely molded. And because of that, whatever the process is, it's very... The tolerances are very good. They're injection molded? Okay. The tolerance are, are very good. So, the, again... If you have any issues with your extruder, it's most likely due to the, the body of the extruder and or the quality of the gears. That's just a part of the equation, but I like that because of its injection molded chassis. Injection molding still has a great purpose of making repeatable functionable, functionable, functional parts. 3D printing is never going to replace injection molding, but it's a good tool to be used for rapid prototyping or making one-offs of stuff instead of having to have a whole entire mold. Welcome in, Pezliz. <laughs> we have a mod, yay! So everyone say hello, Pezliz. Ah, it's not letting tag from Well, that's fine. I'm just going down the list. 
Everyone wants to know episode two. Okay, update on Rook. This, this was not printed on a Rook, I'm just, just a placeholder, but this printer right here is printing okay. I am getting far too many Z artifacts than I would like. So there's something in this whole system that is not ideal, whether it's the BMG extruder, whether it's the tool head, uh, whether it's, you know, my settings, etc. I'm still experiencing greater than average uh, banding and some just some minor issues on the Z axis. Now, it could be acceptable for some people, but I want to make sure that I'm presenting the best possible printer. So I went and wired it. It's actually looking really good. I can give you a sneak peek if you want. I'll remove this. It's a nice polymaker, dual colored silk. Far with this. So I went and wired it all up. I used a very cool type of sleeving that allows you to slide it over the cable once it's been printed or printed once it's been installed. I don't want to lose this camera. All right, there we go. But it's all kind of neatly wired. I have the dual 5015s working and it's overall pretty good. I even have the bottom kind of tidied up. I still have to do some more testing some more tuning to figure out if any of the issues I'm experiencing are you know, user error or if it's a problem with the design of uh, something. And then once that's done, once I can confirm that it's at my quality standards, then I will do a part two where I go over how to wire, manage, cable manage, and what to do with Clipper, etc. But if you want more information on Rook, just check out the Discord for it. I don't know if that's in the video description, but it should be in the previous video on my channel, so make sure to check that out. And go to the Discord and ask them. Um, white oak or maple? Ah, this? This is not wood, <laughs> if you're talking about my table. This is laminate, but not any special or normal laminate. This is a bowling alley lane. So my dad's factory actually makes these. It's a super, super thick, 100% infill. Uh, it's essentially just like layers and layers and layers of special paper. And it's cool. It's very durable too. Again, it's designed to take the impact of, of bowling balls. So it's just straight up a, a laminate. But not like the the, the la like cheap laminate like I have on my other little table here. It's not that. It's it's an interesting process of making them, and they make good tables. Affiliate link for the table. Uh, no affiliate link. This is a one off. Uh. Uh. For. I don't know what you're saying with Pseudocraft, but your switch wire, you want to switch to direct drive eventually, so you're trying to find one that isn't going to break the bank. Ah, gotcha. Well, I think for about 60 bucks or so, the Orbiter V2 is probably the best bang for the buck in terms of performance. It's expensive for an extruder when you consider a BMG plus a motor. It can be as low as like 30 bucks, but for twice the price, Orbiter is very much worth it. In terms of print performance, Oh, also another thing about Orbiter is that it can push fast. It has a ton of torque, like the ratio of the gears are kind of in the sweet spot for the motor. So it has a lot of torque, it has a lot of grip on the filaments, and it can just push a lot of force. And that's something we can talk about too, if you want more information on that. I'm not going over any specific topics, but just answering questions. You want to switch from, yeah, yeah, if you're, again, if you don't want to print the clockwork too, then probably Orbiter. Oh, okay, so a little bit of a sneak peek on Stefan's video. 
uh, from CNC Kitchen. The Orbiter 2 won. Force versus weight. Interesting. So, something interesting about the Orbiter is... Uh, sorry, the... Um, oh, the Orbiter... Orbiter 1. Ah, okay. I In my mind, I read um, LGX. The LGX Lite, I thought, would be the best extruder because it had... Again, a nice gear reduction, had really big gears, but the issue with the LGX Lite is that there's not enough torque. So you have a ton of grip on your filament, but because the gears are so large, it's your max speed isn't going to be as good as like an orbiter. So if that won, then yeah, my internal internal. Internal testing has shown that the Orbiter is the optimal extruder. And I'm glad I'm recommending it because it's good. It's good. And I will watch that video later. It just came out and I didn't have time to watch it. How to mention a person, just add, type at and then hedgehog, uh, hedgehog space makes. And that should tag me. A little bit further back in chat. I'm I'm reading both. So again, I can Yeah, I like that. Do that. I'm, this is uh I need like a, a moderator that takes the questions and then puts it in a like a spreadsheet. Well, that'd be cool. Maybe I'll get some mods in the future. Never heard of Galoop, but you already use CA. Ah. I also use CA. In fact I have my uh Rockler CA glue with a very broken tip. So CA plus accelerator is fast. It's probably the fastest way of joining two parts. But CA glue plus accelerator also discolors your prints. So if you're not post-processing and you want just a nice clean print, like you break a print in half and you want to attach it. Like I actually had to reattach Pikachu's tail. Uh, I don't know if you can really see on here. Yeah, you can kind of see where the tail is. That is just 3D glooped on. I put a bunch of gloop on there. I put the two pieces together, kind of held it in for a few seconds, and I let it sit overnight. And now, it's, you know, it's on there. It's not coming off. So it's kind of like new. In fact, the bond from something like Gloop is better than the layered adhesion of PLA. So I, I recommend at least having some. It's great for just fixing your prints. You don't have to, you don't have to get a big bottle, but just having it on hand is useful. <sighs> YouTube keeps scrolling. I uh, this is not the most ideal setup. I apologize. Undertaker nozzle. Not really a question, but yes, I do use the Undertaker nozzle on as many printers as I can. I need to pick out like a bunch of nozzles, honestly, and just throw them on each one of my printers. I don't switch nozzles. I just keep a 0.4 nozzle on everything. So having a high quality and um, non, I'm not going to say wear resistant, but nearly impossible to wear a nozzle, like just an infinite nozzle, infinity nozzle. You put it on your printer and it's there forever. Unless you have an issue like clogging or uh, maybe yeah, just clogging where you'd have to take it out. But then it'll still be the same nozzle. I think you can even like torch it to remove clogs if you need to. So yes, I love my orbiters. I'll be getting very much more of them. If loop is aquarium safe, I highly doubt it. <laughs> I highly doubt it. Um, but I would look on the... On TDS, and you can contact the folks over from 3D Gloop, or just Gloop now, if you have any specific questions on that, because I just use it. This is not Twitch, nope. Um, this is a video that I don't have to edit that's on YouTube. It's a win win, right? You get a YouTube video that you can watch in the future, but you also get a live stream. Yeah, pretty cool concept.
Is the Rook running Marlin or Clipper? Clipper. Every single one of my printers besides this one right here, the Kaiwu, is running Clipper. The Kairu is still running Marlin because the stock board does not support uh, Clipper. That's one of the, the few cases where there either isn't a config for it or something. There probably can be, but... Um, right now I'm just using it with Marlin and Marlin's working fine. It's as fast as I need it to. It could benefit from input shaping, but I just go slow. That's the solution. And I, I can actually pull off this print. But this is part two of my IKEA lac table. I just color swapped when I run out of filament. Yeah, the corners on here are not great. That's very interesting to see. It's like there's too much pressure advance. I'll have to adjust that. And the texture of the sides, are just, it's weird. Um, this is using a single gear extruder. And I think the tension's a little high, so it has a little bit of artifacting. It's interesting to see. But wow, this is nice. Um, this is the Galaxy Dark Blue from Polymaker. That's a beautiful, beautiful color. I love the actual flakes of the Galaxy. It like almost looks 3D. And then the top, like the bottom finish on that flex sheet that I got with the Kaiwu, it's like, it's hard to see, but it's super like smooth. But this is textured. It's like a smooth texture. It's kind of like satin, but it's not. It's, it's probably similar to satin. But it's a very jarring difference. And I think that's used for the top, yeah. So all my top is going to have that, that finish on it. And now I have two of them. So I have one that's blue, one that's uh, red. Oh, hypothetically, I should be able to join these. So let me answer another question as I try to remove this support. <laughs> I don't have supports tuned very well, so I'm just going to use my little... Uh, I use these for like everything. These are like crafting... This is the Eigen P6 Pro. Little crafting, not crafting. I think they're crafting. They're used for like snipping wire. Uh, they're good for removing solder blobs on your PCBs, but they're also great for filament and part cleanup. As I clean this up, I will read some more comments. Yeah, so the chat right here just kind of skips right to the end. It's, it's strange. How many printers do you need to be a farm? That's a great question. Uh, at least two. I'm not going to say you have a print farm with one printer. A print farm just means more than one printer. So there's no specific requirement but just more all the printers a print farm <laughs> you know it's complete when you run out of space for more printers and when you're looking for like more space in fact the print farm we still think i'd love to start up in the future how many people in chat would like to buy um like rook parts once i get this going i can just print these and sell them i believe so i can sell this type of thing so like different kits for printers or if you want me to print something specifically that is the correct license, like if this was licensed appropriately, I could print and sell these. I might do that in the future. Let me know if you're interested. Let's see. I think I'm caught up on questions. So... I'm currently at, what's the difference between PEI and PEX sheets? PEX, as far as I know, is only from Wham Bam. Are they the only ones who have PEX? But PEX... Okay, when I think of PEX, I think of plumbing. Like, that's like a plumbing thing, you know, plumbing lines, PEX. And it looks kind of similar, and PEX is very smooth, so I'm assuming this has some relation 
but I'm guessing it's just a like a smooth finish. And the cool thing about build plates is that different materials will adhere to different types of materials. So for example, glass, some materials would adhere very well to glass. Some of them will adhere too well, like PETG. It's the same. Okay. So some, depending on what build plate you have, different materials will have different performance. So PEX might be better, maybe, for some, but worse for others. In all reality, most off-the-market, like, heated plates, they'll fit pretty well. Not fit pretty well, but they'll um, have pretty good adhesion. It's all up to what finish you want. So if you want this, like, extremely glossy, smooth finish, then you can get... Uh, whatever, this is again the Kaiwu sheet. I don't know what this is called, but if you look at it, whatever you're seeing, it's going to be replicated on your part. So keep that in mind. If you look at it and it's like this super smooth and glossy finish, then that's going to translate. In fact, it translates too well if you have a glass bed and you're printing something... Uh, that you want a nice finish on the bottom, it's going to have whatever textures on the bed. So you might get an, a non-ideal finish if that's what you're looking for versus some materials. So my best experience so far with the sheets that I've gotten is the Filament branded PEI. Or in general, I think just higher quality PEI, textured PEI. It puts a pretty nice finish on everything. Um... I think this is the bottom layer. So this is an example of filaments texture. So it's kind of aggressive, but it's still pretty small textured. And in person, it looks pretty good. It hides layer lines very well, so it makes for a good first layer. This spot works for you. And there's different grades of pecs like we were talking about on the Z and Z show over on Maker Dex YouTube channel. Maybe we can get a link for that now. But there's different types of PEI. There's textured, smooth, satin, all kinds. All kinds of PEI. So get what finish works best for you and what materials you're printing. Look at the compatibility because something like a TPU, you might not want to print that on textured PEI. But some texture PEIs might work fine. So just, just look around. Read up on compatibility for materials when searching for a build plate of any type. This actually did a pretty good job, decent job bridging. But not good enough for... Oh, I know what the issue is. The tree supports added like little dots on the part. That's making it kind of... Yeah, hard to slide in. Some post-processing is going to be needed in general. And there are good ways of doing it and bad ways. Like, I shouldn't be sniffing, like, little bits off. I should be using something like... Uh, I don't know where it went. Something like an X-Acto knife. That X-Acto knife around here. Oh, here it is. Something like this. This is good for cleaning off like flat surfaces. Be very careful with any knife. But it's good for like getting a surface really smooth, getting any rough edges off. I like to use those for um, bridging and and support cleanup. Uh, you like the satin sheets in your Prusa? A lot of people do. I think satin is a good, like, balance between smooth and textured. So it has, like, the smooth look. Like, probably like this. This is probably a little more glossy. I don't have experience with the Prusa one, but... Uh, it supposedly has a good looking finish, but good adhesion. Capton tape. Why is it amazing? Um, I don't know. Maybe... Kapton just bonds very well to different materials. Um, Rolohan has a whole printer 
that the bed is just a block of like this. The bed is just a thing of PLA of whatever thickness and the top of it is Kapton tape. And you don't need to heat your bed with Kapton tape for PLA so you can just print on it. Pretty cool. Okay, any more questions in chats? Otherwise, I could talk about some of my own stuff. I can make my own questions. Okay. Could you see some potential in a Rook based on a Prusa Mini clone kit? So you're talking about taking a Prusa Mini kit, a, a clone kit, and then turning that into a custom 3D printed printer. That is a good question. Did I test fit this? See if it roughly aligns. Oof, so it looks like... Interesting. Okay, I just didn't squeeze it in. So when it's connected, these, these are two corner pieces, so they don't go like this, but these are connected. That should work out pretty good. I don't know, I might loop it, too. It's for extra strength. But hypothetically, this system kind of locks together. And oh yeah, I see how it works. The way that it locks, it gets kind of stronger as you put pressure on it. Yeah, because it like presses in. Oh, that's neat. Wow. This is going to be a thick print. I get a lot more of these to print. This will be used as a, a table. Where's the lack going? You think I think that far ahead? I just print stuff I'm like... Geez, I just printed this big thing. Where the heck am I going to put it? <laughs> um, this might go in my kid's room or, you know, it's a, it's a very attractive looking piece. So it would fit nicely in your living room. I'm joking. A side note on this table, like a more realistic answer. If I can get these back apart. <sighs> just want to see if the, they actually fit together. They fit together very well. So I'll continue to print these. Um, what I did, this is a good example, this blue is the top, so pick your favorite filaments. Hey, there we go, we got a link for the Maker Deck YouTube channel, make sure to check that out. Uh, it's Monday, Monday at 10 o'clock Eastern, I'll be going live with Pezliz, with, with the Z and Z show. We'll be talking more about 3D printing and a similar topic like this but a little more uh, organized and not question-based like this. So pick out your favorite filaments. In fact, you can use the same filament for all the top surfaces and then use random scraps for the bottom. So if you're just looking at the top, it can be all like the nice the same type of filament, maybe even, you know, a decorative one, like, like a really expensive filament to do a couple layers of that and then do the bottom in anything, any other filament, maybe one color to keep it simple, but that's a great way to have a, uh, a nice looking top, but then just use random scraps, whatever you have left. That's what I did for this. I loaded a filament, I printed it until it ran out and I swapped to another color. I'm trying to use up as many spools as I can. Right now I'm down four spools, just using up bits and scraps of what's left that I don't like throwing out. And I'm glad these fit together too, so I will put these in a pile. I'm excited to see what it's going to look like when it's finished. Eighty to ninety for ABS. Eighty to ninety what? Bed temps? Ooh, for ABS, that seems a bit low. I like to go about as high as I feasibly can for pretty much any bed temp. So PLA, I print at 60. ASA, I print at 90. ABS, uh, 100. And sometimes even higher, a little higher, depending on what type of build plate you have. Where's your deburring tool? Uh, I actually don't have a 3D printer specific one. I still need to pick one up. So 
Right now, my funding is going into the Death Racer. So, April... April 22, the week of that, I will be going to the Rocky Mountain Rep Rep Fest. That's going to be a lot of fun. Hope to see you all there. Um, you can go to rmrrf.com. You can get a link for that in chat. But I'm building a Death Racer, which is a little tank. I don't have many... Little... I don't have too many parts for it, but I did purchase a uh, controller. I'll be testing this out, seeing if it's any good. Who knows? It might not be. I might return it. It might be fine, and I'll keep it. But I'm going to check this out and program it for more content on the Death Racers and the Rockbone Rip Rock Fest. Uh, join the Polymaker Discord. There's a section for both of them. And yes, this will be mostly likely a kid's table. It actually is it's extremely beefy. The only thing I'm worried about is are the legs. It does use a fairly aggressive screw thread on the bottom. So I'm sure it'll be fine. I printed it in the strongest PLA I have. Uh, PLA for this whole thing, by the way. And hopefully that'll be fine. Luckily, if something breaks, you can either just gloop it or... Prints off another part. That's what I love about 3D printers. When you're designing something, if something breaks, you can print replacement parts. It's awesome. I, I absolutely love 3D printing. And that's why I'm doing this. I want to get more people interested, more people informed, and just on the right page for 3D printing. I don't want you wasting your time or money. So I'm trying to give the best possible suggestions that I have based off of the experience that I've had as a consumer, as an influencer, as you know, a tester for like different filaments, etc. This is a lot of fun for me, and I hope you guys like it too. If you're trying to post links, this is YouTube, so links are not allowed unless you're a special mod. Um, so sorry about that. If you're posting a link, it'll just get automatically removed. I don't even see them. What time are we at? 11.30? Okay, we'll go for about... 30 more minutes. That seems realistic. Do you use a UPS backup for your printers? That's a great question. No, not currently. I have before, and it has worked fine in cases of minor power outages, but I have so many printers at this point that it wouldn't be feasible to run them all off of UPS because I'm just running them for hobby use. If anything, I would just put one on my main printer. So the printer that prints the best, the one that I'm always printing with, I would have one on there. But if I have a power outage that's more than, let's say, a few minutes, then it doesn't matter anyway. I don't believe in print resume. I don't enable that. So I just don't. If the power goes off, my print's dead. Done. Uh, what was I going to show you? Oh, uh, that's what I was going to do. Okay, let's see. Let's see if I can set something up real quick for you guys. Maybe. Maybe. You guys can chat in chat. If you have any other questions, feel free to post them in chat. If not, I have a few topics that I can bring up. I don't think I have any main topics to talk about in general, so I'm, I'm safe on that. Like, I didn't say I'm going to talk about this specific topic. Just answering your questions. And if you think this has been useful, let me know. Again, if you're watching this in the future, leave a comment down below. If you have a question, post it in the comments down below, or wait for another one of these episodes. I'm not sure how often I'll be doing them, uh, I plan on doing them at least regularly, and hopefully on a better schedule, like maybe every other week, or even like every Saturday, we could make this type of thing happen. There's always questions, always new things happening, there's so much to do. And where are, what am I looking for? 
Ah, okay. Perfect. And thank you all for these subscriptions. I greatly appreciate it. I am... I guess the goal right now is a thousand subscriptions on YouTube, so if you're not subscribed yet, make sure to do that. But, not necessary. I, I, guess, I think it is the chat, but uh, you don't have to subscribe if you don't want to. But, you might want to. Maybe, maybe. You might want to subscribe. I heard it gives you good luck. Alright, let's do this. Want to make a copy. Yeah. Where's the copy? Perfect. Okay. Uh, we got a link for this. I want a short link. So for those of you who are here, I should have probably set this up a bit earlier. Here is a link. And I will pin that link. So in chat, I have a link for a fill link giveaway bonus prize for staying this long or just tuning in. This is for a spool of Polymaker filament, so something... Anything from the top shelf. <laughs> so this is for a PLA, PETG, ABS, and ASA. And a huge shout out to Polymaker for helping with um, everything. For helping get me filament, for testing, for random prints, printing stuff, and building things. As well as being able to get back to the community with these giveaways. So fill out that form. If you have any questions, let me know. And I will do a drawing in about 20 minutes. And this is global, so anyone can enter. I have some questions like Discord information. If you have it, great. I can reach out to you there. If not, that's perfectly fine too. I'll send you an email. Back to the stream. Any more questions? You found that a good UPS unit for Enterprise. Yeah, I, I, it depends what you're trying to do for UPS. Right, so you can you can just have it work for like a minute, and it doesn't really matter what you get. Or you can try to run it off of a longer outage, so you need more batteries, etc. But UPS is definitely a much much better option than power resume. I've heard some talk in chat about printing. I think ABS. You can print ABS open air. There are specific recommended settings. Uh, I don't really print ABS open air. I have an enclosure for it specifically to get just better overall performance. But I believe printing hotter, that's like the key, is printing hot and then using minimal fan. You need a little bit, but not a ton. And if you can enclose it, that's for the best. Any type of draft, any type of drastic change in temperature, will cause the filament to you know, ugh, shiver. And when it shivers, it, it, you know, it goes together. So whether or not that's from temperature related, it's, it's definitely temperature related. What do you think causes warping? Let me know. What, what causes warping? I was asking that. What, what is warping? You like Polymaker? I do too. I love Polymaker. You don't, you can win this filament. You live in Brazil. Ah, you think so. This is global, so anywhere that you can legally win giveaways, it'll be sent to you. It might take a little bit of time, but definitely enter. ABS shrinks when cooled. Yes, but does warping... Uh, what, what's causing it to actually lift from the plate? Is it internal stresses? Do you think it's cooling, shrinking the layers? Okay. I'm not an expert on this, but there is a quite... It's quite the debate and a lot of different, not evidence, but different theories on warping over on the Polymaker Discord. So if you want to give your experiences, and if you want to do some tests, I would go check them out. What are you using for streaming and video tech? That's a good question. 
So for 3D printing, you generally want to, or a good idea, sorry, something fun to do with 3D printing is sharing. So I live stream. Right now, this is a Logitech C930E for the webcam. This is just a webcam. My overhead camera is a Logitech Brio. I found that having a 4K camera as an overhead allows you to zoom into stuff you know, fairly fairly good. Like I can zoom way in hypothetically. Are you working? No. Wow. You can zoom way the heck in <laughs> and then kind of toggle it around and still I actually move that. Ah, here we go. I can get, you know, way, way in like here. This is a ceiling mounted webcam. Then you can read that. That's pretty impressive. You would not be able to do that with a standard webcam. So it's nice to be able to, you know, work on some stuff and have the ability to zoom in. You can lock the focus too, so it doesn't try to autofocus. Oh, we should talk about these. Yeah, let's do that next before we close out the stream. Yeah, so this is just my my view. I think I have it at 78. No, it's like this and then like this. So that's my overhead camera. And then I also have a close-up camera, which is just a C920, your standard C920 from Logitech uh, on a tripod. So I can take this tripod and lift it up so it goes pretty high or bring it down. I can also turn it into handheld mode. I'll probably get rid of this strap, but I can hold it for handheld use. This is useful for showing off stuff. And the autofocus in the C920 is honestly not bad. It's pretty usable. So that's my current camera setup. That's the most important thing is having new cameras. In terms of tech, I mean, I have my gaming computer running everything. If possible, it's best to run a separate streaming computer. Because uh, if I slice something, everything's going to freeze. Just because of how slicing engines use up uh, enough resources that it messes with my computer. <laughs> and I will be getting a, uh, a stream deck in. I finally decided to get one. I have a capture card for... HDMI if I need to capture with that. Otherwise, just good lighting. That's the best thing. The best tech you can do for streaming is lighting. I have a lot of light in here. So it makes a cheap webcam look half decent. Honestly, this doesn't look that bad for what it is. I'd love to get a good camera like a DSLR. If you want to help me with something like that, again, I have a Patreon. I will gladly uh, love to accept like a, a DSLR for better image quality. But this is fine. This is getting the point across. And for what I do, I am perfectly happy with this. So some stuff uh, about warping. Again, I don't really actually know a ton about it, but I like to hear what people think. And it's usually they think it's temperature related. They don't consider internal stresses. Images are great. That's awesome. YouTube has a higher bit rate. So I, am I streaming at 1080p? I should be streaming at 1080p. You should have that option. Yeah, 1080 60 even. And the bitrate should be fairly high compared to Twitch. So if you're coming from Twitch, this is going to look a lot nicer. And one of the reasons why I like streaming on YouTube is because it's just an overall better viewing experience. Plus, it auto records and then puts all the information right in my channel. So after the stream, I have a full video that you can watch. It's pretty cool. DSLR is dead. That's what I mean. Um, I don't know if I said that, but yeah, I want a mirrorless something probably like HDMI out with a capture card. That seems ideal. Uh, you got a carbon filter run chamber at the end of the print. Pulls down faster. Interesting. So as you take in cold air from outside and then no, you wouldn't do that. You exhaust hot air? 
how does it cool down faster? Which is great. That's good. Glad to hear. You have an A6000. Do photography. Hope to start video. Ah, that's the cool thing about a lot of photography cameras. They're also good at recording video. I took my Canon uh, T6i at one point and used the lodged or Canon's like beta webcam software, and that worked fine. I was able. To, it wasn't a full 1080p image, but I was able to use it as a webcam. So you can definitely, with a lot of these cameras, especially if it has a clean HDMI out, you can use them for streaming. You just pop it on a tripod, like I have mine, and then stream with it. All right, I don't think there's any more specific questions, so why don't I close off this stream by talking about Swatch Truck. Uh, this is not a link that I have yet, but I can put this down below. Remind me if I don't actually put a link down below, by the way. This is the Swatch Truck. I'll put it down here and I'll let you take a look. So this is a model that I created from scratch. It's not based off of anything particular. I did a couple iterations of it and found that this was kind of the, the best like little form factor that I can come up with. So is this actually working? Find the right camera? Ah, no, wrong camera. Okay, uh, C920. Let's fix the focus. Actually, can we get a link for that in chat? I can just type in truck and that should come up. My camera tries to cooperate. So this is my swatch truck. I'll post that in the chat. Go check it out and I'll put it in the video description after the stream. But this is a multi Oh, the cameras are not responding today. Another issue with webcams is that all the software or all the calibration stuff is digital, so you don't have a lot of control over it versus like a DSLR or mirrorless camera. So yeah, this is a calibration tool. It has a few features that are... Focus? Yeah, a few features that show they help you calibrate different things on your printer. Um, the main use for me is flow. And I still have to do a lot of testing on this, but uh, flow is this giant kind of labyrinth of math and, and calculations that a lot of people kind of look over. But in general, you have your slicer telling your printer to push a distance of filament. Everything's done in distance. So if the, let's just say, for example, your slicer says push 100 millimeters of filament. So the extruder is going to spin however many revolutions it takes to push 100 millimeters of filament. Here's the thing. It has no idea how much filament to push. But you tell it, you say, okay, if you spin around one revolution, then it's going to push X amount of distance. So in Clipper, that's called, I think, rotation distance. Um, in Marlin, that'll be considered E-steps. But that's how you tell the hardware how much to spin. If you get that wrong, that it'll clearly show either over extrusion, where your top surface has way too much filament and it's very rough, or under extrusion, where you have gaps. So that's step one for flow is getting your hardware kind of correct. And this is very important. I have not fully tested it yet, but extruder tensions do impact e-steps, at least they should. From my basic testing, 
If your extruder is too tight, it digs further into the filament and it actually has a smaller gear ratio as if it was just riding on the surface. I don't know the specific math behind it, but I believe, um, wow, can I do an example? Yeah, here. Here's an example of two gears, right, meshing up against each other. Uh, this is Amish Ace's uh, logo, by the way. It's a nice little coffee coaster. This is my logo that I have to implement everywhere. So you have these two gears meshing against each other. You know, they're both going to spin at, let's say, the same speed. But if you have too much tension, let's say this is your drive gear and this is your filament, then suddenly your effective gear ratio is reduced because now it's driving a much smaller section in the middle. So it's going to spin... Um, let's see, how does that work? Slower? Faster? Slower, slower, faster, whatever. From testing, however the math works out, it feels like the more tension you have, the more that it presses in, the slower, slower the filament actually extrudes. Yeah, yeah, that's, it, it, seem, it seems weird. Lower, slower. Okay, yeah, so this would spin slower if this is pressed in more. Or if you have less tension, then you're suddenly increasing the gear ratio, or at least the effective gear ratio between the... Again, this isn't a gear, it's filament. So it's a bit... You can't really compare it. And I don't have a great... Obviously, I haven't uh, written a script or anything on this, but just check your extruder tensions. It, 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 regardless... If you have your filament digging in, it's going to have a difference in how much distance it extrudes, depending on your tension. So the ideal tension is just barely digging in. Higher pressure, slower filament. Yes, higher pressure, slower filament. AKA under extrusion. So, yeah, if you have more tension, you'll have under extrusion. If you have less tension, you'll have over extrusion, hypothetically. So you want to find that perfect extrusion amount. And there's a couple ways of doing that. And number one is testing it with grip. So you extrude a bit, you lock your motor, and you try to pull out the filament. And you want to tighten it so that you can pull it, and then you loosen it a little bit, and then it slips. Then you retighten it a little bit more. So you want to find it so it's just barely digging in to your filament. So that way it doesn't deform it. And uh, you get even contact. That's another thing. The more you dig into filament, the more uneven the finish is going to be. I don't know if I can show it very well on this camera, but this is the surface quality on the walls from that Kaiwu. It's kind of like bumpy is a lot of inconsistent extrusion. And I'm guessing that's because there's probably too much force on the filament. A lot of grip, but surface quality kind of suffers. So you'll want to mess around with the extruder tension. Once you get your tension set, then you can actually calibrate your E-steps. This is when you do a measured input versus output, like how much you feed in, and then how much you actually get out. There's different methods of doing that, and I would recommend searching for your printer or just in general. So once you get the hardware calibrated, then your slicer would hypothetically interface like one to one. So if it tells it to push 100 millimeters of filament, they'll push 100 millimeters of filament. On Kira, I find that if your E-steps are calibrated, it does a pretty good job of flow management. So your top surfaces, everything's going to be pretty good. In Prusa Slicer, the magic number for your flow is generally, for me, it's 
versus 100% flow. So 9.925, anywhere from 0.92 to 0.93. It's weird. It's a weird number. It's a weird algorithm. And it's all dependent on your print speeds. There's a lot of factors on it. But 92% uh, for like a PLA or like a hard material, like PLA, ABS, um, I find that those print pretty well around 92 93 percent flow. And to verify that, I developed the swatch truck. <clears throat> Let me drink the water. I'm doing a lot of talking today. <laughs> Non-stop talking for hours and hours. And we'll drop a spool of polymaker filament in about uh, three minutes or so. So make sure to enter that form. It is pinned in chat. So if you have any questions, let me know. I can probably repost it. Where's the link for that? These people are see people are actually entering. Yeah, we got some good. Let me recopy that link. Perfect. And then throw that into the chat. So fill out this form. This is for global anywhere. For a spool of polymaker filament. Thanks once again. So this is using a method from, uh, who is it? Uh, whose surface flow calibration method do I use? It's linked in the actual uh, file. I'm trying to think. If you remember who it is in chat, uh, Ellis, yeah, A Andrew Ellis tuning guide. So he says, or they say to print a bunch of rectangles and look for the surface flow. You're testing a bunch of different flows and ideally you want your top to be, here's a good example of like almost perfectly calibrated flow. This is slightly under extruded. Uh, it's not, actually not perfect. It's, it's, it's under extruded. I found this printer actually, wow. My camera is not liking that. Interesting. Wow. Interesting. Okay. So, yeah, it's slightly under extruded. So there's gaps between the lines. The thing is, you don't actually see that in person. You can. You can see it a little bit. But there's a big difference between when you're looking for a smooth finish with no bumps or when like something like this, which has too much flow, it's kind of rough. It's a little bit rough textured. So the very fine balance between how much flow you have, how much film you're pushing and what you actually get. So I tend to lean on a little bit of under extrusion for flatter surfaces. If you're doing something strong, you might want to increase your extrusion percentage. It's going to be dependent on many, many, many factors. Uh, far too many to go over in this video. So I recommend checking out the swatch truck, checking out what it can do for you. Um, you can see if it's, if your flow is good enough, you're generally able to spin the 0 0.2 wheel after breaking it apart. Uh, if you have too much flow, it might not spin. If your printer is not accurate enough, it might just bind up. If you have too much squish, it's a good test to show the squish. So I'll be doing a full video on this once I learn a little more about different types of flow calibration. You can change it for just the top layer. Absolutely. That is a, a very viable and honestly, whoops, we're ending. It might be where I'm going to go to in the future is just calibrating individual features. So your first layer calibration, um, your top layer, but I find that in general, 92% works overall, like 93% probably works fine for PLA, the faster you print, generally the less or the more flow you need because of a thing called um, flow, uh, flow under extrusion, uh, drop off graph thing. That is far too much information to go into now, but the faster you print, 
the more under extrusion you get. And that kind of goes like, uh, where's my chart? So the more flow you request, the less it's actually able to deliver. And there's a bunch of under extrusion that occurs at a certain speed and past that. Is that going slightly under? Yep, I, I, I lean towards a little bit of under extrusion. It seems to work well for me in terms of looks. Now performance, that's very different. If you're trying to get something very structural, you will want to tune it a little more precisely. Uh, I don't use Z-Hop. Yep, I, I don't use Z-Hop. None of my prints need Z-Hop. I don't get any nozzle dragging. And... Uh, what else did I see? Yeah, just, just look into tuning your flow. Use the swatch truck as a rough guide. It'll tell you, if you can look at this and see, okay, yeah, this is acceptable top quality, uh, then you're great. But if you see a lot of gaps, check and see why. Why are there gaps? Why, why is there like, weird artifacts? And you should be able to get a really nice, clean swatch truck. There's a reason why this won first place in the printables contest. Mostly because it's cute, but... Oh, well. Let's drop her some filament. So I'm assuming everyone's filled out the form. Last chance to fill it out. The link is in the uh, in the chat and pinned. Each printer here works different. You have uh, two under threes and one UM2. Can't print with the same profile. Ah, see. Here's my key. All right, here's my secret. When I calibrate my E-steps, I use the same exact process on every single printer. So I use PLA Pro from Polymaker. It's a very hard uh, material. I should probably actually use something different, but right now I just use PLA Pro. I get the tension set fairly well. I can look at it when it's um, you extrude a bit and you unextrude, and then you can look at it and see, okay, it's not really digging in a ton, but it still has some grip. I'm good. So I find out what works best for grip, for whatever filament I use, and then I use that same filament for every single E-Steps calibration. So hypothetically, every printer can use the same profile, and yeah, it works. The difference, though, is volumetric flow. This is where you will really want to dig into uh, what printer you have, what filament you're using, etc. I can talk a little bit about volumetric flow after the giveaway, and then probably close off the stream. So let's close that giveaway form. I'm going to unpin it. Okay, all entries now will be ignored. And then let me go ahead and copy and paste that in. Uh, the person who wins the giveaway I will reach out to you via email, or if you put in a Discord name, I'll reach out to you over Discord. And I think I'm going to switch to this going forward for pretty much all my giveaways, because it's a bit more reliable in terms of information. If I can find the form, here it is. Awesome, got a bunch of responses. Okay. Grab your names. Perfect. If you win this film, you're going to print a rook. Awesome. Yeah, get some PLA. <laughs> print a rook. All right. So this is episode one. So everyone in chat, I need you to pick a number between one and one. We'll shuffle that a lot of times. Be number between one and one. You got one, 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 forty-two. One, one. I think we're gonna go with one. Okay, so shuffling one time. And good luck, everyone. Ooh, I don't think I've seen this name before. Tesla Actions. 
Are you in chat? Are you in chat? Because you just won yourself a spool of Polymaker Phil Lynch. Are you in chat? You're here! Awesome! Awesome, awesome. So, once again, this is for PLA, PTG, ABS, ASA. If you're global, if you're in the US, you'll actually receive a email with a coupon to use on the Polymaker store. So this is something new that Polymaker is doing. Uh, let me just record your name. Uh, right here, perfect. Uh, green, perfect. So if you go to the US website, which is us.polymaker.com, if you live in the US. If not, um, you'll just get sent filament directly, picking out a spool. But you can actually just use the site and you'll get a coupon to essentially get pretty much any, any color you want. Like this new color changing filament. So it actually changes color based off of the temperature it is. I will be trying this out and I don't know. You think it'd be cool to print off a rook printer in color changing filament? I think that'd be neat. So, if you have any questions on that, you can always open up a, not open up, um, contact me over at Discord. That's the best place to message me. Or open up a ticket on the Polymaker Discord. But yeah, congratulations. That was a lot of fun. I'm going to close this off in a few minutes, but let's talk about volumetric flow rate. A quick summary and kind of a sneak peek into what I've been working on. Oh boy, volumetric flow. Um, I don't have any slices open. Let's just open a Prusa slicer regular. Uh, does the coupon get added to your account automatically? You have to fill out a form, so I will send you a form to fill out, and then once you fill that out, depending on your location, you will get a, uh, a coupon applied to your account. It essentially has to be linked to your email to be able to use it, like so not anyone can just use the code. So this is Prusa Slicer. Uh, let me switch to a printer that's not an MU. Make it easier. Actually, here is a... Bone stock Prusa. Here's a Prusa with generic PLA. Actually, let's go Prusa Mint. Uh, Prusa Mint PLA on standard quality. So this is a pretty typical situation where you're using all default everything. But in your filament settings tab above, you'll find this. This might be hard to see on mobile. I do apologize, but I'll explain best I can. You have extrusion multiplier. Currently, it's set to 1. And depending on your E-steps, this might be correct. So you can compensate for too much flow, too little flow, by adjusting this extrusion multiplier. Two point six sixty six. What? You guys are way behind in chat. If you're just putting numbers now, can't stay. Hey, thanks for hopping hopping on in. Hopefully, this will be useful for someone in the future as well. Anyway, yeah. So extrusion multiplier is at one, um, and that's the only thing that's really important. But in Purchase Slicer in the Advanced tab, there is something called Max. Volumetric speed. This is a very, very important number, in my opinion. So the default for a lot of profiles is 15 millimeters cubed per second. That is the volume, how much physical filament is being pushed out of your hot end. Different hot ends and different hot end plus extruder combinations will allow for a different max volumetric speed. You'll actually see advertised on some uh, some hot ends, like Rapido advertises, I think like 
45 millimeters cubed per second uh, for like their standard flow or something like that. But d depending on the material you're printing, depending on the extruder you're using, if you have a very weak extruder, it won't actually be able to push the max volumetric uh, capability of your hot end. So something like an Orbiter 2 might be able to reach that limit because it has a lot of pushing force and it's able to extrude fast. But if you have something like a stock single gear extruder, non-gear reduced, then your max volumetric speed is a lot lower. So what does this actually do? Uh, let me just do a brief example. Let's slice... Yeah, let's slice this, this lac table. So this is what I've been printing. Uh, available on printables. So if I slice this, I'm probably going to lose a second. Using the stock settings. Oh, wow. There we go. We're back. Uh, that's a lot of infill. <laughs> Lots of gyroid. <laughs> Looks kind of funny. Anyway. Down at the bottom, it says feature type. And you can change... This is in Prusa Slicer. Volumetric flow rate. And it gives you different colors based off of, essentially, how fast... Not how fast, but how... Yeah, how fast the filament's coming out. How much physical amount of filament... Uh, so right now, it says red is 12.5, and then blue is 1.5. So the walls are usually going to be slow. Because, you know, not, not as much filament coming out. Which is, in turn, generally more accurate. It's easier to push filament slowly. And you get the best results. So for your outer walls, your volumetric flow rate is very minimal. Uh, but then as you go to the inside wall, it's faster. And then the infill is even faster than that. So for this model, it looks like uh, I don't actually have any red. So the fast six it's extruding is around lime. So like six millimeters cubed per second. Well within the capabilities of your extruder. Infill doesn't necessarily have to be perfect. But this is what I do. This is how you speed up your prints. This is the key. First, you want to set your volumetric flow rate to something that is obtainable by your printer. And you'll have to test this. There's the CNC Kitchen model, um, the racetrack. If you do like the CNC Kitchen racetrack, racetrack test, that's very, very useful for finding your max volumetric flow. It's also going to be based off of what filament you're using and what temperature you're extruding your filament. The hotter you extrude, the more flow you're able to uh, achieve. I'll be making a full video on this in the future, so let me know what you want to see. But let's change this to, let's say 12. Let's say your hot end plus extruder can do 12 millimeters cube per second. Well, in your print settings, I do this, speed, Let's set our infill speed to, I don't know, let's go crazy, 500 millimeters a second, 5,000, sure, whatever, it doesn't matter. And then re-slice. Again, this is why I use a separate streaming computer. But now, our max volumetric flow rate is 12.5, well, at least... At least the range is 12.5, but we set it to 12. So now our infill is at 12.5 millimeters cubed per second. So I set it to, what, like 5,000 millimeters a second. It'll never hit that because we're limiting the flow. If I go to speed, we're only hitting 150 millimeters a second for the infill. Welcome in 3D Experience. We're actually about to close it off. So if you have any questions, feel free to post them. And uh, if I have time, I'll get to it. But we're just talking about volumetric flow rate. Or at least like a preview of what you can expect. So yeah, we're only printing at 150 millimeters a second. And this is why 
when a printer advertises how fast it can go, it's irrelevant, in my opinion, because your wall speeds are going to be slow. They're always going to be within the capabilities of your hot end. No matter what you have, what printer, your wall speeds are going to be slow for quality. But your infill, or the stuff that's not visible, that you can just push however fast you can. So I like to go have my set point for my infill as fast as I can possibly move. And then, of course, you know, you actually want to uh, maybe like 300 millimeters a second or something like that. It doesn't matter. You can have the worst printer in the world, but it won't actually hit that. Yeah, you can get away with less accurate infill for sure. And even the external perimeters are like uh, small perimeters or perimeters in general. Let's say 80 or something like that. We can we can set this and as long as it's within the volumetric flow um, limitation, then you'll be fine. Now, one thing to note is that for something like perimeters, etc., um, I like to keep all similar features around the same thing. Because the flow does decrease as you go faster, you want them to be somewhat similar. So my external perimeters, I usually run at 40, and my regular perimeters at 80. An infill doesn't necessarily matter, so I go as fast as I can. Except for solid infill. I find that solid infill is good around 120 millimeters a second. You don't want too much under extrusion. I'm talking um, these bits right here. You don't want too much under extrusion because you want it to be somewhat strong. What hot ends is for? This is this is just a generic example of if your hot end was able to push 12 millimeters cube per second. This is kind of the performance you can expect. And just increasing your infill speed by you know adjusting it based off of your volumetric flow rate that can significantly increase your print time or your print speed another hack and this is the last thing i'm going to give a teaser on is your uh where is it I'm looking for here Uh, oh, it's under advanced for some reason. Okay. Your extrusion width. If you have a 0 0.4 millimeter nozzle, you are not restricted to print 0 0.4 millimeter lines. What I love to do is... Yeah, I'll, I'll share my secret. So, my first layer, I generally run... This is all with a 0 0.4 nozzle. I run my first layer at 0 0.55 my perimeters at 0 0.4 uh, no my perimeter is at 0 0.55 my external perimeter is at 0 0.44 my infill at 0 0.66 my solid infill at 0 0.88 and my top solid infill at 0 0.44 so for my walls outer walls and top I do just about as fine as I can, so just above my nozzle width. And the reason for the four, four, five, five, six, six is because I'm actually reducing my flow, and that reducing your flow reduces your line width. So in order to get it kind of correct, I just add uh, like a four or a six, or like I think double the number. That seems to work fine. So what this does is it puts the first layer a little bit wider than your nozzle for better adhesion. You can also, if you're finding that you're having a hard time with first layers, you can increase your first layer to like 0.66. Perimeters, the internal ones are not really seen. And you can take care of gaps with gap fill. I like to put that at 0.55. Infill, you don't want super thick infill, but you don't want super thin infill. So I like to do 0.6. It's a pretty good balance. I'll actually look at a part and I'll change the infill percentage based off of kind of how it looks. <laughs> Solid infill, this is a big one. 
this is where you want to extrude as fast as you can because it's your slowest feature. So if I reslice this model, uh, let's just put it at like 5% infill for this example and slice it. So our first layer is now, uh, let's go by width, so line width. Our first layer is at 0.6. These layers are at 0.8. So our solid infill is super, super thick because it's actually better for strength too because you have less lines. And then our infill is 0.6. And then we get to our top surface, it brings it back down 2.4. And when we look at the volumetric flow rate, well now there's a lot more red. So we're we're trying to get as many features as close to the volumetric flow rate as possible. With the, you know, the restriction, you know, make sure that your printer can actually move that fast. So I also set a like a max speed for your printer, whatever it's capable of moving at. All the external features, very low volumetric rate. All the internal features, very fast. That's how you get a fast print. And you're not going to really see it in quality because nothing's visible. So that's a nice hack. And again, more information on this in a future upcoming video. If you want a better explanation, feel free to join my Patreon and I'll post some stuff there ahead of time. Uh, so let's take this same exact print. So it's currently nine, nine hours, 44 minutes. Let's change this back to the standard, the standard setting and slice it. And it was at 5%. So now at the standard setting, we're at 13, 13, uh, let's say almost 14 hours. So like 10 hours versus 14 hours. That's pretty significant for just changing your line width. Yeah, that that's insane. So it's worth looking at tuning some stuff that is not visible, but also impacts speed by quite a bit. Otherwise, in order to get the same, you know, the same speed, you have to significantly increase your travel speed, like, you know, your, your travel speed for, for all of this stuff right here. And fast does not equal good for a lot of cheaper printers. So it's better to just increase how much filament you're extruding. So TLDR, find your actual max volumetric speed, do some form of tests and figure out how fast you can extrude. Whatever that is, whether it's, you know, 10, it could be eight, it could be 20 for some specific material, do this and then adjust your print speeds accordingly. So, so no, you don't have to print at um, 100 millimeters a second. You don't have to ever insert that setting. There's almost never a case where you want to just like this printer can print at 250 millimeters a second. What does that mean? Every feature is a different speed. It doesn't make any sense. Maybe the infill can go that fast. I don't, I don't understand things. I don't understand marketing. Uh, do you have a link to CNC's racetrack? I might. Uh, I don't know if my printables link is in the description. It should be under test print. Let's see if I can pull that up real quick. Cause that's what I use. Uh, so it's under my profile, uh, collections, maybe under calibration prints. No, or, oh yeah, it is, it is, it is perfect. Yes, I'm my calibration prints. So this is the racetrack. Let's see screen capture. So this is what it looks like. Essentially, it just moves your nozzle, your hot end back and forth. And you can slice it 
a specific way so that it slowly, like every X layer, increase the speed. And then look in your slicer and kind of figure out, okay, at the very top, you want to make it so it's extruding, uh, let's say, a, uh, you know, whatever you think your, your printer can hit. Let's say it's 15 millimeters cubed. But let's say it fails down here when it increases the speed. Well, whenever it fails is when you can test. That's when you know what your max volumetric flow is. Uh, and for example, in Clipper, you can just increase the speed and it gives you the flow, which is kind of neat. So this is my print that's happening live right now. I'm printing some Voron parts. And a lot of time it's just printing at around 4.3, 7. It's not going very fast. I think it's doing some of the top sections so the speed's reduced. But it's not actually printing that fast in terms of flow. Speed, it might. But I don't look at speed. I look at flow. And maybe maybe that's why I'm, I get so confused when people talk about, oh, I'm just printing at 150% speed. What? 150% of what? what? You can't just increase your print speed. Every single feature has a specific speed assigned to it. So that's why I don't like to just... You know, okay, I'm going to make my print go faster. I'm going to increase the speed by 200% or 200 Well, now your external walls are twice as fast. Your internal walls are twice as fast. Uh, TLDR, slice your model correctly. I'll be going over a lot of tips and tricks on slicing that I've learned. And there's some stuff that just does not make sense to me. 150% speed, that's a lot of fast. Yeah, that's fast. Well, when, you're, when your print speed is 25 millimeters a second, jumping up to double that, oh boy, that's 50 millimeters a second now. That's fast. Oh. Start 80% off the charts. You guys are killing me. If you want to feel like your printer is inadequate, watch some of Vez uh, 3D prints. Yeah. He has a video where he prints at 2,000 millimeters a second actual printing speed. It is insane. That's a lot of acceleration. Uh, Alright, well, I think that's pretty much it for today. If you have any other questions, leave them down in the comments below. Make sure to join the Polymaker Discord if you want to ask any other questions about 3D printing. If you want more personalized questions, if you have them, Make sure to join my Patreon. I have my own private Discord for that. That's been going pretty well. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to continue to make this type of content. I'm going to work on my Rook printers. I'm going to test filaments. I have a lot of stuff that I'm planning on doing. If you have any questions, you're likely drinking coffee. Uh, I haven't had much coffee today. <laughs> a couple hours ago. Yes, lots, it, it takes a lot of caffeine to do 3D printing. And I hope you like the slightly improved studio. Um, I still have to set up actual walls and then put all the filament on rep racks. But it's, able, it's nice to be able to see all the filament, especially when you're looking for a, a specific color. Otherwise than that... Oh, yeah, uh, make sure to like and subscribe. Hit that bell ring that uh, hit that hit that smash bell like the button no uh leave a comment dislike hey, give a dislike button try to hit that does that actually work does that do anything um how do you how do you outro like should i have like a thing that does that does like ending and then oh well now you know that's ending that's a great idea i should do that Let's figure out how to get a, a little splash screen that says ending. Can we, can we get that? Go in and make something!